heart of where innovation, money, and power collide in Silicon Valley and beyond. This is Bloomberg Technology with Caroline Hyde and Ed Ludlow. Welcome to Bloomberg Technology. I'm Ed Ludlow in San Francisco. We're standing by for a special conversation with the Coinbase CEO, Brian Armstrong. Have a listen. First thing you did, and how, how far do you think you're going to have to go here? Yeah, well, this was not um, unexpected. You know, we've been in discussion with the SEC for a long, long time. Even going back to before we were a public company, we started sharing with them how we operate our business, how we list assets on the platform, how we think about our staking pro program. And through a large number of dialogues back and forth, they allowed us to become a public company. Um, you know, we had many discussions with them in the last year when their, their tone started to change. And they started to come to us with more questions about the business. So we were very forthcoming. We met with them probably 30 times over the last year. Um, and we started to kind of ask them for feedback. And we said, you know, we, we would like there to be a robust market in the U.S. to trade crypto securities. Of the 1,000-plus assets we'd re we've reviewed today, we've rejected 90% of them. The ones we trade, we believe, are commodities. What feedback do you have for this for us? How can we come in and register? How can we work together? And unfortunately, we were met with silence. Uh, we really got no feedback in those 30 meetings. Um, the first meeting where they were scheduled to come and give us feedback, they canceled it a few days before that, and then we got a Wells notice a few days after that. So it's really unfortunate. We work with regulators all over the world, other regulators here in the US. Um, I think I've, I'm a reasonable person to get along with. Um, but unfortunately, the SEC under you know, this chair has taken a regulation by enforcement approach instead of creating a clear rule book in the US that can allow this industry to be built in a safe and trusted way. You know, when was the last time you personally met with Gary Gensler, and what did you say? Right, so when he first came in as the chair, um, I, I flew out to New York. I, I reached out to him. Our team has reached out. I tried to make an effort to connect with him in person because that's what I try to do whenever a new regulator kind of comes in. Um, unfortunately, we were not able to connect at that time. I'm not sure why uh, we couldn't get on his calendar. Um, and we followed up a few times in the, in the year after that. We eventually got a meeting that was virtual. It may, it may, you know, it may have been COVID-related or something like that, but we were able to get a, a virtual meeting. But unfortunately, it was frankly like a pretty icy reception, I would say. Um, you know, I, we sort of came in hat in hand and said, hey, Chair Gensler, you know, you, you've asked people to come in and register. Respectfully, we're here to register. What would you like us to do? What, what um, process would you like us to go through? And his response was, um, you know, talk to your lawyer. I'm not here to advise you. And um, that was kind of how the conversation started. And so and at that point, you know, we realized um, there was a gap. <laughs> you know, we felt like this was an important technology that we felt um, needed to be built in a safe and trusted way here in the U.S. in a way that consumers were protected. And um, I don't know what his motivations or, or pers you know, his personal views were, but it didn't seem like he was on the same page. So what does this mean for you if the government cracks down so hard on crypto, on Coinbase, the SEC? Does Coinbase exist in five years? Absolutely, we do. And I want to make an important point, which is that um, the SEC chair may have a certain point of view, but that's not representative of the whole U.S. government. Um, in fact, quite the opposite. I would say um, the SEC chair is, is a bit of an, is really an outlier here, kind of um, in the U.S. government. So when I meet with members of Congress, I think the broad consensus, probably amongst 80 percent of people I talk to on both sides of the aisle, it's a, pretty, it's a pretty reasonable view they have, which is we don't know exactly what this technology is going to become, but we're seeing every other major financial hub in the world move towards clear legislation. We need to make sure that this innovation happens in the U.S. in a way that, again, let's just protect consumers. Let's apply some, some basic good ideas around AML KYC and audited financial statements and make sure there's no wash trading. Let's create a clear market structure where you know, businesses can understand which CFTC, SEC, who should, who should they talk to about which types of assets. So Congress is, is recognizing this. And the, well, the White House is as well. Actually, the Biden administration put out an executive order about a year ago um, kind of asking all the branches of government to sort of say, get your act together on crypto. We don't, there's some risks, but there's some real important opportunities with this technology. Let's create a clear regulatory framework. Will you fight this all the way to the Supreme Court? Do you think you'll have to? And do you have the financial resources to do that? 
Yeah, so um, even if this takes some time, uh, that, you know, that's okay. Um, we, we, we've, so in Q1, we were adjusted EBITDA positive as a company, even in the depths of this crypto bear market, if you want to call it that. We have over $5 billion of balance on the balance sheet, right? So, um, and, and frankly, even though that this complaint came in from the SEC, it's really business as usual today, right? Uh, we're continuing to trade the assets that we have on our platform. Um, you know, we trade over 200 assets on our platform. The SEC complaint mentioned just 13 of them, so a relatively small percentage of the assets we trade. Um, we also have business overseas and other countries. We, we derive a lot of revenue from other sources that are not related to trading fees. So um, you know, Coinbase is well capitalized and um, adjusted EBITDA positive in Q1. I think we're going to be fine going to court. In fact, um, it's a relatively small portion of our company that, you know, we have a great legal team, policy team, et cetera, that's working on this. And what I really want, you know, 90, 95% of the company to be focused on is just building great products for our customers and making sure we don't lose sight of that. And so this is a very serious matter that I'm going to work on with a couple of our executives. Um, but really, the vast majority of the company needs to keep building because that's how this technology is going to ultimately benefit a billion people, hopefully. How long does the regulatory overhang last? The reality is this could take many, many months. And do you think that your investors might lose some faith or even your customers while you go through this? Yeah, well, I mean, look, this is not a new concept, right? Um, there's been lots of discussion. The SEC has had rhetoric around this for several years that I think has influenced the market. Um, and so the investors in Coinbase are you know, comfortable with that if they're because they're, they're it's all public, right? And it's not like some secret thing that's being revealed. Um, and I think they're taking a long-term view that um, Coinbase is a very different company. We're kind of an, an N of one, right? We're we're really the only company that was based here in the U.S. that went public, that has audited financial statements, that's taken a compliance-first approach. Um, you know, even in this recent SEC complaint, by the way, that came out yesterday. It was unfortunate they, they sort of did it back to back with other, another complaint that went out there and I, you know, that may have been intentional to try to conflate the two. But I think people are smarter than that and they recognize that um, you know, this complaint against Coinbase, there were no allegations, <clears throat> no allegations of uh, mis misappropriation of customer funds. There was no allegations of wash trading. You know, myself and the executive team were not named personally. Um, it's really debating this more technical legal question of are some of these assets commodities or are they securities? And, um, I think that's something the court will have to decide to sort of get some legal press, some case law out there, which will ultimately benefit us because we, that's what we've been asking the, the SEC for for a long time is how do we get more clarity? So if we need to go to the courts to do it, um, it's not our first choice. We'd rather the, the regulator had just published a clear rule book. But if they're not going to do that, the courts are there in the U.S. to avail ourselves of. So part of this was about securities <clears throat> being registered or not in terms of how they're listed on your exchange. But part of this was about staking also. So staking obviously is becoming a more important part of the crypto ecosystem. Do you plan, based on how the regulators are treating staking, to wind down your staking service? No, we're not going to wind down our staking service. Um, again, as these court cases play out, it's really business as usual. Uh, we're going to continue to operate that. Um, you know, snake, staking only represents about 3% of our net revenue, but it is a, um, it's a very important function in the crypto uh, community, and it serves an important part of these decentralized blockchains. And I guess I should mention also that, um, you know, Coinbase's staking product is, is architected and built um, in a way to be compliant, and we actually think it's materially different than some of the other ones out there which have been called staking. Um, and so, yeah, we're, we're going to continue to operate our staking business. So if users wanted their funds back in the staking service at this point in time, does Coinbase have the ability to service that at scale in case that there is a larger run on the staking business? Yeah, so um, you know, staking is really something that's a decentralized uh, part, of, part of these decentralized protocols. So Coinbase is really just, um, you know, it's a pass-through mechanism. We're helping people access these decentralized protocols. So some of the decentralized protocols have, for instance, like a lockup period of you know, some number of days when you initiate the withdrawal request. And so we're just making that kind of information available to the customer. Um, but it's, yeah, you know, all the, the funds are there backed one to one. When you're, when you're staking something, it's being pledged into these, um, these decentralized protocols. And we actually don't even have the ability to you know, move it somewhere else at that point. It's, um, we're just giving people access to these decentralized protocols. So the business face withdrawals, does that have a material impact on Ethereum's price? And how does Coinbase prepare for something like that? Um, I'm so, what do you mean? 
Is there kind of a broader run that you have to be prepared for? Oh, well, okay. So in, in our business, we're not, we're not a bank, right? We don't do fractional reserve. Um, and so there's not really this concept of a run, right? All the, all the funds are there backed one to one and you don't have to take our word for it. You know, our, as a public company, we have auditors, Deloitte in this case, who's gone in and verified all of that. You can kind of confirm it in our financial statements. So, um, you know, if people want to withdraw funds, they, 100% of it is there. There's no such thing as a run, really. So how do you answer the question of, you know, on one hand, there is the SEC that is, uh, you know, causing a big overhang in terms of both you guys and the industry. Uh, on the other hand, just financially, you know, rates are higher <laughs> in the United States. Yeah. People are more inclined to keep their money in a bank. Why should they keep their money with you? Well, what's interesting in crypto, um, there's been the evolution of something called stable coins, right? And so um, we're actually uh, in consortium with another company in the circle in the space. We've, we've created a USD coin, which is the second largest stable coin out there. And um, as you mentioned, interest rates in this environment, that's been both a good source of revenue for us, but it's also something that we've um, passed along to customers. So uh, customers can actually uh, earn rewards on USDC um, and get, get access to some of these higher interest rate environments. Broader question, not just about Coinbase, but about the industry. As you know, more regulatory enforcement actions come to the forefront. How much of an overhang do you think that will have on crypto pricing? You know, it's hard for me to say. It was actually kind of surprising yesterday with with this complaint that came out. Crypto was up, um, which I would not have expected. So I don't know what to make of that. I don't know if it means that people it knew something was coming, but they expected it to be worse than it, than it actually was, or um, um, if they just felt that, you know, they're, they're still a believer in it or something. But, uh, you know, I, I, I don't try to predict what's going to happen in these markets. You know, <laughs> uh, we don't operate a hedge fund or anything like that. Um, we just want to provide a good service to our customers around the exchange and all the products we offer. Before I let you go, I want to ask about not crypto. I want to ask about artificial intelligence. We've been okay. talking about it all day. As a crypto entrepreneur, how do you see uh, AI? Do you see it as a competing factor uh, in terms of dollars going towards technology? Do you hmm. see it dovetailing with your industry at all? Well, AI is certainly one of those couple really important technology trends that the US needs to get right along with crypto. And I think we're seeing a similar question start to happen in Congress along with crypto is like, hey, how should this be regulated so it can be done in a safe, trusted way? Um, I do think there's a couple interesting intersections between AI and crypto. Uh, one of them is that, you know, in the world of AI, there, it, you know, it's so easy to mass generate things, whether it's a news article or images. Um, and so the provenance of those and the authenticity of it can be a little bit hard to figure out. And in a world of crypto, one of the great things about crypto, you know, with NFTs and whatnot, you can actually have a digital signature that proves, um, you know, this was issued by Bloomberg or um, by Brian Armstrong or whoever. So I think it could be useful to track the provenance of creative works, whether that's text, audio, video, et cetera. Um, the other thing that might be interesting is that a lot of these, these you know, bots or autonomous agents um, in the AI sphere they're going to need to go get things done in the world, right? People are already using them to sort of say, hey, order my groceries or, you know, maybe build this website and spin up this server. And so they're going to need um, financial money. They're going to need money to go do things in the world, these, these uh, AI agents. And so I think that actually in the future, you're probably going to see a lot of crypto transaction happening between AI agents or um, AI and various businesses around the world because crypto is kind of the native money of the internet. The internet, internet is global, it's decentralized, every country, everybody in the world can participate in it. Um, and so it wouldn't really make sense to use um, you know, the dollar or the euro in a truly global context if you, you, know, you want to be country agnostic. So I think AI will use crypto more. How much are you actually working on that future? Mm. Um, so, our, <laughs> we're not trying to build something that is um, allowing bots to like transact in crypto at the moment, but what we are doing is we're building good infrastructure, you know, picks and shovels, if you will. So with Coinbase Cloud, for instance, um, we're making our APIs around how crypto is stored and transacted and commerce happens. And we're just exposing those kind of like Amazon Web Services, but to any business that wants to integrate it. So I suspect more businesses will integrate that over time and some of those may use AI. Um, we're also using AI in our business in a few other ways. I mean, we use it a lot for fraud prevention. Um, you know, and unfortunately, we, we get people uh, signing up, putting in stolen credentials and things like that. And so we've developed a lot of really good um, machine learning to detect that. And, um, 
you know, we're occasionally, we're testing it in a few other areas too, just like around, actually like, you know, our design teams, um, they'll sometimes look at um, Midjourney or Dolly and sort of generate an interface using AI, or at least like, you know, show me five ideas for what an interface might look like um, to do remittances in crypto or for content creators to uh, have a direct relationship with their audience and what would the interface for that? And AI is just like a great assistant. It, you know, it doesn't, I don't think AI really is taking people's jobs, it's taking tasks off their plates largely to make their jobs more efficient. And so um, having like a, you know, a research assistant or someone like that, you know, a tutor, or a mentor, or a therapist, whatever, everybody can have one of these um, paired with them and I think it'll just make humans more productive. Brian, we're out of time, but thank you so much for your time and for taking our questions. Thank you. You are watching Bloomberg Technology. That was a conversation with the Coinbase CEO, Brian Armstrong, at Bloomberg Invest in New York. Let's bring in Bloomberg's Katie Greifeld out in New York to kind of wrap some of the headlines coming out of that conversation. Katie, what were the key takeaways for you? It was really interesting to hear a little bit more color, a little bit more insight on what Coinbase's sort of communication, what the relationship with the SEC has been. It was really interesting to hear from Armstrong saying that basically the SEC's tone has changed in the past year, that Coinbase went to the agency multiple times, was met with silence. And as a result, here we are today. And we knew that they've been critical of uh, the SEC's approach. Obviously, we got that statement yesterday, basically criticizing yes. what they call this reliance on enforcement, regulation by enforcement. And we heard more of that today from Armstrong himself. As a reminder to our audience, the SEC sued both Coinbase and Binance's U.S. operations this week, uh, essentially accusing them of peddling unregistered securities. What was interesting, Katie, on stage, Brian Armstrong referenced that other suit away from Coinbase without naming it and said that to his mind, perhaps the SEC was trying to conflate the two. And uh, what did you make of that? Yeah, he really tried to draw that line between these two cases. Obviously, we've been talking about them in the same breath since I think it was, what, less than 24 hours that separated those lawsuits. But Armstrong said that in Coinbase's case, there were no allegations of misappropriation of funds, no wash trading. There weren't any executives named. And I think that's important because when you think about Binance, it's a lawsuit against Binance and also against Chang Fan Zhao, of course, the CEO of Binance. That's not the case when it comes to Coinbase's uh, Armstrong described it. This is really about sort of a legal sort of definition of securities. That's the common thread between these two lawsuits. Basically, what is a security? But in terms of the Binance allegations, they go much deeper. Some more headlines crossing the Bloomberg terminal in that wide ranging conversation, really. Bloomberg Shanali Basak also asking about AI and Armstrong saying that Coinbase is using AI in the field of fraud prevention, for example. He, he put a lot of emphasis on this idea that Coinbase is a public company and therefore it is audited. Mm. And so the SEC, if it wanted to, could go and look under the hood, so to speak. That's the interesting thing. I mean, with Binance, of course, Binance doesn't have headquarters. It's a much different case than Coinbase, which is a U.S. public company. The, it listed in 2021, again, a public company. And the fact that we're seeing this lawsuit come against them after it was allowed to go public has definitely raised a few eyebrows among my sources. But wrapping it into the AI con, uh, conversation, very interesting to hear that, you know, they do see opportunity there. I would imagine that Coinbase is a little big, busy with this legal fight, but sees yeah. opportunity there as well. I don't want to draw a causal link, but interesting to look at the shares. We're off session highs, but tick by tick, we kind of pushed higher throughout that conversation. I notice on the Bloomberg, there are buyers <laughs> out there for this name, right? Kathy Wood being one of them. The usual suspects, yeah, Kathy Wood adding uh, to her Coinbase stake. Across ARK's fund, the biggest stake, of course, was added to in the ARK Innovation ETF. That's her largest ETF. And this is sort of her MO, you know, by her favored names when they're dipping. And that's what she's been doing in Coinbase over the past year. So unsurprising to see that trading update overnight that they also added yesterday on what was, what, a 20% drawdown. It makes sense when you follow her strategy. I want to go broader for a moment. Interestingly, Mike Novogratz, of course, the Galaxy Digital, talking about the SEC 
is going to take some time. The legal overhang remains. But three quarters of the crypto market is still for play in the US. He's saying, look, the SEC is not mentioning Bitcoin, ETH, stable coins. What are flows like? What ultimately is this doing to sentiment? Well, the question I keep getting is, why isn't Bitcoin reacting more? I mean, Bitcoin is still hanging around levels that it's been hanging around for the past several weeks, even though, again, the two largest exchanges have been sued at this point. But it really comes down to, I mean, who's left? We know that retail, sort of the marginal retail player, was flushed out a while ago. You're left with sort of these true believers who have been holding it for a long time, and that continues to be the case. I mean, I track ETFs very closely, both globally and in the US. And globally, when you look at sort of these ETPs that can actually physically hold Bitcoin, there's not too much movement in or out because, again, that marginal player has already been flushed out. And I like that you say global because this ends up becoming a global arbitrage story in a way in terms of where you base companies, where talent flows. Are you hearing about basically a loss of talent in the US to the Middle East, Dubai getting its regulatory act together, Hong Kong, for example, even the UK a little. Well, that's the thing. I mean, you listen to US crypto advocates in the US, and that's sort of the argument that they make, that basically the agencies are scaring away talent, they're scaring away innovation to overseas. And we know that you know certain regions, certain countries have been trying to attract that talent, Dubai in particular. Whether that actually happens, remains to be seen or maybe some of the people who were in crypto pivot maybe to AI maybe to web3 but that's an open question and it's uh, definitely a big question in the industry Katie Greifeld great to have you with instant analysis we thank her for her expertise across crypto meanwhile well let's check in on the markets another key area of expertise for Katie of course she's a cross asset reporter we want to go cross asset for you for a moment because well overall we've seen a little bit of sentiment shift once again tech ticking down we're off by seven tenths of a percent we're more worried about interest rates we're more worried about where the Fed goes Canada a surprise rate hike over there we see the dollar lower versus the Canadian dollar the loonies it's known down three tenths of a percent but notable that still we've got to look to the Fed the ECB next week what will they do in terms of trying to do this awkward balancing act? Growth on the one hand and inflation on the other. The two-year yield goes up 11 basis points as basically the market price is in that the rate hikes are not done yet. Sure, there might be a pause in June, Ed, but what about July? And just quickly right. looking at what's happening in terms of Bitcoin because, you know, it is our risk asset of choice when it comes to the tech world. And we're currently off by some two percentage points as well, even though overall the dollar hadn't been showing so, so much strength today. 26,000 is where we're at. Right. There are other news items in the world of technology that are, that are making moves in markets. Keeping a close eye on Tesla, up for a ninth straight session. Longest streak of gains since February 2021. The news being the U.S. Treasury Department uh, saying that all Model 3 variants are eligible for the full $7,500 tax credit. Netflix off session highs but have been up as much as 5%. Two names at least raising price targets on the stock, Wells Fargo and JP Morgan. That stock touching its highest level since February 2022. And Warner Brothers Discovery tackling the debt issue by offering a $500 million tender. That stock up 5%. Take a look at Coinbase. Shares of Coinbase have been higher. That conversation between Shanali Basak and the CEO, Brian Armstrong, one of many interviews he's done, out in force responding to the SEC suit against them, higher by 2.7%. But off session high is interesting, the kind of pushback that he gave during that interview. And we will recap later in the hour. Carrie. Well, and meanwhile, we've got so much more coming up in, well, still the private world of technology. Reddit reducing its workforce as part of its plans to restructure operations and promote growth. We'll have the details when we return. This is Bloomberg. Time now for Talking Tech. First up, well, Elisa Moll, CIO of Michael Dell's family office, says she's looking to diversify her portfolio. The firm DFO management is set to absorb an influx of cash and stock once Broadcom does eventually close on its purchase of VMware, it's still with regulators in Europe. I sat down with Moll at the Bloomberg New Voices event, where she shared her thought process behind her investments. What I have been grappling with is we have this impending major liquidity event. And so how should we be committing capital today? How do we size our investments today? 
Dell, VMware's largest shareholder, has a 36% stake in the shares, of course. Meanwhile, European chipmaker ST Micro and China's Sun An are planning a $3.2 billion joint venture to build chips fabrication plants in southwest China's most popular city. Now, it's part of an effort to tap into China's growing market for electric vehicles, but look, counters the EU's push to localize chip production. Production is expected to begin in the fourth quarter of 2025. Plus, let's talk about a private company now, Reddit, planning to cut 5% of its workforce, or roughly 90 positions. This is according to a staff memo from the CEO, Steve Huffman, and it was seen by Bloomberg. The online discussion platform is also scaling back its hiring plans. Reddit now joins a slew of technology companies that have turned to layoffs in order to cut costs, boost profitability. And Ed, of course, this is an important one to think about, as this was a darling that was expected to go public. Maybe it'll help reopen what has been a frozen IPO market, but they've got to show, well, profitability over just growth at all costs. Yeah, we, we reported this story out 24 hours ago, and when I was reading the memo from Steve Huffman, the CEO to staff, it jumps out that this isn't an action taken because of hardship in their business environment, but because they basically looked at it and said, you know, we can achieve break even next year. Of course, they filed for an IPO in late 2021, Caro. We haven't heard much about that since then. I would point out one thing. Smaller company, 2,000 people. Mm. So 5% is about 90 jobs, which is never pleasant to talk about layoffs in the technology industry. It's not, but it does, as you say, sort of feel small when we think of the hundreds of thousands of people who have lost their jobs thus far from big tech, from some of the other companies. Ultimately, though, it's about the way in which you manage and the way in which you tell people that this is one and done or not sprinkling on a continued yeah. basis, because otherwise it hits morale, right? Yeah, it hits morale, and, you know, Huffman addressed that in the memo that, that we saw, basically saying that this will impact many people who have been at that company for a very long time, but one that seems to be weathering the storm. And as we, we write in the Bloomberg story, they were a holdout. You know, it's taken them until uh, this point of 2023 to enact layoffs, when many others had d done the depth of them at the end of last year. Well, we've got a lot to talk about when it comes to companies having to think about profitability over growth and indeed perhaps doing some tie-ups to inject more growth when it comes to AI at least. Yeah, and one name that I'm excited to talk about coming up, Twilio and Google Cloud get into, guess what, Caro? Generative mm -hmm. AI together. More on the why with Twilio CEO Jeff Lawson. That conversation coming up here on Bloomberg Technology Next. Really quickly, I want to take a look at Palantir. This is a stock trading at its highest level since January of this year. The news, which is driving this performance, actually not so much now, up three tenths of a percent, had been much higher earlier in the session, as much as 11 percent. After Palantir announced, it was operationalizing data and introducing automated efficiencies for the Panasonic Energy of North America facility in Sparks, Nevada, a really key facility, particularly for Tesla, mm. for which it supplies, for yeah. example, that a multi-year agreement the stock now actually basically flat. Look at that chart, giving up most of its gains. One to watch, though, from New York and from San Francisco, this is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Technology. I'm Ed Ludlow in San Francisco. And I'm Caroline Hyde in New York. Let's check in on these markets once again, Ed, because, look, we are seeing more risk aversion when it comes to big tech. Remember, this has been the outperformer on the year. Today, we pulled back almost a percentage point in the NASDAQ. So we're hitting further lows, it feels, across the main benchmark. The reasoning uh, is about where the Federal Reserve goes next. It's about tackling inflation. It's about whether or not we have another hike come July. That's what the market is pricing in on the bond market, at least two year, five year. That belly of the curve as well, moving 13, 14 basis points higher as we start to price in what the Fed could do. And indeed, this is a global perspective. We've seen a surprise move from Canada today, the Canadian loony going high, higher versus the US dollar as we get that rate hike to tackle inflation. We look to the ECB next week and, of course, the Fed. I'm looking at Bitcoin currently under pressure off by 2.4%. A lot of regulatory overhang here at the moment, Ed. 
Let's get to our next story, Carrie. Twilio and Google Cloud just announced an expansion of their partnership to bring Google Cloud generative AI to Twilio's customer engagement products. The idea to improve experiences for millions of end users. Twilio CEO Jeff Lawson joins us now. Jeff, this is interesting because I think over the history of your company, you've worked with Google Cloud closely. Um, just explain in real terms what any of that actually means if you're a Twilio customer. What do you get access to with this generative AI tool? Well, specifically, this Google partnership is uh, a new partnership to help bring generative AI and predictive AI into the contact center. So by combining Twilio's Flex contact center product with Google's CCAI, we can now automate a wide variety of interactions in over 30 languages to provide uh, real-time intelligent automated interactions to customers. So for example, uh, Toyota Connected is one of our customers. There are millions of Toyota and Lexus vehicles on the road where if you hit the button and say, you know, I want to ask for directions, for example, that's a completely automated experience powered by Twilio Flex and Google CCAI integrated together to provide that complete automation. And this is just part of Twilio's newly announced um, a customer AI initiative yeah. that we announced yesterday. And customer AI is really the intersection of all these new capabilities of generative and predictive AI and combining that with the customer journey. And every company has this journey as a customer progresses through sales, marketing, service, inside the product, that companies are trying to connect together to create a cohesive and relevant experience for those customers. And what Twilio can do is bring generative and predictive AI to the table to help connect each one of those experiences based on the segment profiles that we have living inside of Twilio about each one of those well, customers. Jeff, and so we're really excited to get this out there into the market this week. How are you ensuring that people feel comfortable as and when they're being serviced with so much more, well, effect. People worrying about their data, wondering about how companies are owning it. How are you ensuring that this isn't going to, yes, bring productivity, but also a lot of pushback at the same time? Absolutely. And people should be concerned about privacy and, and uh, data security, as well as the effect of large language models and AI on, on uh, many of our experiences. And that's why we have, uh, first of all, only partnered with uh, data uh, or partnered with AI companies, so language model companies that are going to preserve the privacy and integrity of our customers' data and their customers' privacy. Second, is using that data only in the context of that one customer in order to make that experience better. Now, we are all accustomed to this as a net positive as customers of companies who do it well. Think about Amazon or Google. You know, your and my Amazon homepage are very different because Amazon uses all the data they have about us, like what we clicked on and what we scrolled past, what we bought, what we didn't buy, in order to make that product better. And what we're seeing is now every company out there, because of privacy, needs to actually take their own first party data. So that stream of data about what do people click on? What do they buy? What do they not buy? And turn it into insights about that customer that then can make them smarter and provide a better product and uh, customer experience. Yeah. And that's what Twilio is providing to companies. What's interesting, Ed, is of course, amid what is a macro environment that is cloudy, to say the least, yeah. a lot of companies are out there talking about AI effectiveness and actually feels like quite a busy space. It's got to be about the actual underlying technology here, Ed. Well, that's the question I have, Jeff. Like, I get the Google Cloud relationship. It's long-standing. When you build the product into your existing platform, where does the underlying technology come from? Is the foundation model from Google itself and what they've been working on with the broad company? Was there a temptation to go to OpenAI and build something on top of GPT 3.5 or 4? Well, Google is the first of, of several partners that we are working with, and we will be announcing more over time. And I think that, look, there are going to be the right models for the right use cases. The one common thread among every vendor that we are working with is the fact that we are only going to work with vendors and models where we can control the flow of data and where we can ensure that data remains uh, belonging to our customers, which is the most important thing. And look, I think every uh, large language model vendor, I think every AI vendor out there realizes that businesses are gonna to wanna to control this. They need safety and security around these models. And they need a human in the loop for most of these use cases to make sure that as the AI is doing greater and greater workloads, we've got great checks and balances on the work that they're doing. And so that's what Twilio and I think many other uh, uh, software as a service companies are doing to yeah. go create viable products out of the raw capabilities of a language model. 
I referenced there, Jeff, that in amongst all of these innovations, new product launches, partnerships, is a macro environment that is tougher. It's been tough to your company in terms of market cap, in terms of share price. I'm sure you go push back and say, I don't look at the share price, but ultimately your investors do. And I know you're someone thinking about activist investors at the moment as perhaps some of the control that you've had ultimately in voting rights seeps away a little. How are you tackling that at the moment, Jeff? Well, look, we've always been a company that is looking at the interests of our shareholders and operating the company in the interest of our shareholders by talking to the shareholders and understanding what they want. So during the era of low cost of capital for the last decade, right, we ran the company to grow the top line, to build our market share. And I'm really proud of the company that we've built in terms of a $4 billion revenue run rate company during that period of time. Now we're in a different environment. Now we're in an environment where we take that market leadership position that we're in, that large customer base that we're in, and turn it into a profit generating machine. And that's exactly what we've been doing. And I'm really proud of the fact that over the last two quarters, we have uh, taken a company that has never historically generated a, a consistent profit because that wasn't the goal to now generating more than 10% non-GAAP operating margin in Q1. And so I think we are listening yes. to those investors and taking substantive actions to respond to the changing needs of investors based on the changing needs of the macro environment and interest rates. Jeff, specifically, the information reported that you're talking to Legion Partners. What is the update on that? And I notice in the proxy materials published yesterday, the first four slides outlined the structure, effectiveness, track record of the management. That's an unusual thing to do. Why did you do that? Well, we talk to all of our investors um, frequently, and right, we get a lot of opinions, we get a lot of points of view, and so it's just a regular part of talking to our investors of understanding their, their points of view. Um, regarding the disclosures we made yesterday, we just wanted to uh, fight a little bit of, I, I think, you know, misinformation or lack of understanding of some of our decisions about how our compensation model has worked um, as we head into the proxy voting season. We want to thank you so much for spending some time with us, talking us all through business model, new applications, new focus on AI, the Twilio CEO, Jeff Lawson. Thanks. Let's just return to what's happening over at Bloomberg Invest today, because billionaire Stan Druckenmiller says he expects that AI, guess what? It's here to stay. And then he anticipates owning NVIDIA shares for a little while longer. He spoke with our very own Shanali Basak at the summit in New York earlier today. The AIs have sort of dominated the long portfolio for five or six months. If it's as big as I think it is, um, NVIDIA is something we're going to want to own for at least two or three years, not for 10 months. And maybe longer. Meanwhile, we've got a little bit of breaking news. Amazon planning an ad tier a prime video streaming service. So, as we've seen with the likes of Disney, as you've seen with Netflix, now Amazon too. That's all according to the Wall Street Journal. So, more to come on Amazon. Also, more to come on generative AI and indeed investing. We've got so much more with Sapphire Ventures. Kathy Gao, that's next. This is Bloomberg. Guess what we're talking about next? Generative AI. Of course we are. It's what everyone wants to discuss. And many feel that this is truly a platform shift. Or, well, maybe you take the other side of the coin, you think it's hype. Let's dissect it all with VC Spotlight now. Kathy Gow's with us, partner at Sapphire Ventures. And I can only imagine how many inbounds you have at the moment suggesting that they are AI or from their very root and their cause. How are you deciphering which company is truly artificial intelligence amplified or those that are kind of getting on the bandwagon, Kathy. Well, thanks so much for having me back. Um, and great question, Caroline. This is a question that we think about constantly. I would say the fundamental principles of investing haven't really changed, right? At the core, we're still looking for companies that are solving a very specific problem and have a point of view on their right to win. So that could mean owning a very specific and valuable workflow for the end user. It could also mean having access to and interacting with proprietary and valuable data. But a company should have a point of view. And there are companies out there that have a thin layer of application on top of commoditized infrastructure. For us, those would not be companies that we'd be excited to invest in. I think another very interesting thing that we have to think about as investors is in what situations does it make sense for an existing company 
to add in AI features into their mm -hmm. product and platform. So a, a great example of this is, you know, many of us use Gmail or Outlook. We can pop open our email and use auto-complete right. or auto-generate um, to help us respond to emails. So that's an example of an existing platform integrating, folding in AI the thing into is the that platform. That's tangible, right? Like I was at Google I.O., I saw the demo, but Google already owns that. Right, Absolutely. and so you have all these startups out there in the field. And the thing that I want to ask you is, how confident are you that any of them will ever make money? You know, I, one example, Character AI. We had Noam Shazir on the show a few weeks ago, and it kind of seems like an afterthought. That's alarm bells for a VC, isn't it? Absolutely. Well, I would say this. I think um, at Sapphire Ventures, we are building our prepared mind to be ready to invest in AI. And I think it's gonna be a tremendous opportunity for VCs in the next three to five years. That being said, it's very, very new today, right? Um, we wanna take some time to see how this plays out. If you think back to previous technological fundamental platform shifts, the ultimate winners may not have been the companies that came out of the first wave. And I think of Google, right, that came after Alta Vista and Yahoo, and I think of Facebook, who came after MySpace and Friendster. So for us, it's all about learning about the current environment and the market and watching what's going to happen and being prepared to invest when the timing feels right. Earlier in your career, you were looking at China. I know it's an area you thought about. How fierce is the competition between the entrepreneurs here in the United States and what entrepreneurs in China are doing? You know, as a VC, how do you navigate that field? I would say... AI is certainly a very, very competitive field, but I think it's a mistake to only look at it as US versus China. It's really a global dynamic. The reason companies all over the world are investing in AI is because the tremendous potential for AI to transform possibly every industry out there, right? And maybe this is me putting on my optimistic hat, but I do think that global solutions, global collaboration is what is needed. Because ultimately, AI does have the potential to solve problems in healthcare, in climate change. These are problems that transcend national borders. You know, Caroline, the story of the week in this industry was Sequoia splitting into three, right? And one of the rationales being that they can have a unit focused on China because there is opportunity in China. There's, there's entrepreneurs and there's support from the government. Yeah, but... They can't seemingly manage to do that from a globally coordinated manner with the back office that serves all three. And to that point, Kathy, how, how global can you be as a venture fund right now? How much are you able to navigate these geopolitical headwinds? That's a great question, Caroline. And I, I got to tell you, I'm closely watching what's happening with Sequoia. Um, you know, the news is relatively new, so I can't speculate on what is happening in Sequoia. But the moves they have made will for sure impact the venture capital industry. And what Sequoia has publicly said already, which is managing a global organization is difficult, right? You have to consider portfolio, conflict, uh, portfolio conflicts, not just in the US, but in multiple geographies. It is, in fact, very, very difficult to handle. And um, Sequoia's solution to break the firm up into three separate entities is just one solution. But I'm very curious to see if other large global, global venture capital firms who are also investing in other countries follow suit or come up with other creative strategies. Sapphire Ventures, Kathy Gao, it's so good to have you back on the program after mm. all these months. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much. Now, coming up, we sit down with the CEO again of Coinbase for more on the SEC crackdown, a deeper dive following his remarks a little over 30 minutes ago at Bloomberg Invest. That's next. This is Bloomberg. I do believe, um, unlike crypto, I think AI is real. It's probably, it could be as transformative as the internet. It, it's a huge thing. Stanley Druckenmiller earlier at Bloomberg Invest. Let's get more on crypto. Send it over to Bloomberg Shanali Basak and Coinbase CEO Brian Armstrong Shanali.
Thank you, Ed and Brian. Thank you for joining us. You've had a very intense 24 hours. When you look at what the charges the SEC has brought forth against Coinbase, how long do you think it will take to fight it, especially when you have your chief legal officer telling me last night that you would go all the way to the Supreme Court if you have to? <laughs> if necessary, yeah. I mean, look, we don't know exactly how long this court case will take, but I do think it's a really important opportunity for us as you know, the leader in the U.S., to go get some clarity for this industry and for America so that we can make sure that this, this technology is built here and doesn't get pushed offshore where customers can get harmed. I think if you just, if you go back in time a little bit, you know, back to 2021, uh, we had a number of discussions with the SEC about becoming a public company and they allowed us to become a public company with full knowledge of how we list assets and how we operate our staking program. And it really, you know, wasn't until a year later or so that they started to have more questions we very thoughtfully engaged with them. I think we met with them 30 times over the last year, uh, explaining every aspect of our business. We, we came in hat in hand and said, how do we register? We want to register. You know, we even acquired a broker-dealer license, which is still dormant. They, we haven't found a way to activate it. Uh, we formally petitioned them for more clarity around the rules, and we frankly were met with silence. And so, um, unfortunately, they decided to pursue this policy of regulation by enforcement. We've got the Wells Notice, and now the complaint is officially here. And so this is a difficult moment for not, not only the industry, but also for America. We need to make sure we get a clear rule book so this, this technology can be built here. Is there a point at which you call it quits on the United States, given how hard regulators are coming down on the industry? No, we're not going anywhere. I mean, I started this company in the U.S. because not only is it a big market, there's, there's rule of law here, right? You know, we have to follow the rule of law. So does the SEC and everybody. And so luckily, um, if we're not getting a clear rule book from the SEC, we have the opportunity to avail ourselves of the court. And we'll start to get some case law created, regardless of what the outcome of the case is, honestly. It's, it's a step towards more clarity. The other big opportunity we have is really for Congress to step in here and act. And I think there's a lot of interest in Congress. We saw a bill uh, come out last week from you know, McHenry and Thompson sort of clarifying, OK, this is the role of the CFTC and the SEC, and let's have some good consumer protections. And what about stable coins? And so I think there's a broad recognition within Congress that the U.S. is going to get left behind if they don't start to create some regulatory clarity, because the U.K., you know, Hong Kong, Singapore, um, the UAE, these are all saying, we want to be crypto and Web3 hubs. We have clear rule books. Come here and build your business. And the U.S. is at risk of being left behind. What happens while things are so unclear? <clears throat> is there a chance here that you start to lose customers or even and banking partners here? You have J.P. Morgan, Cross River, all these other more traditional financial institutions that you've worked with. Do they start to freeze up when the government does not have clear rules? Well, so far, we haven't seen any risk of that happening. I think all of our partners are, have been very thoughtful working with us. We've been very transparent with them. And I think they're, frankly, waiting to see what the outcome of some of these cases are, too. And how does the U.S. get to a path of more clarity, whether that's um, with the CFTC stepping in in some role, Congress, the court case, you know, maybe the elections in 2024 change this as well. So our partners have been really great to work with. And, you know, we're the leading company we're in the U.S. We're not going anywhere. Elections in 2024, do, do some of these pressures on the industry potentially go away with a potential change in administration? It's possible, yes. I mean, I, I do think that, um, you know, the chair in the, the SEC here is a bit of an outlier, frankly, in the U.S. government. Um, you know, as I mentioned previously, Congress has, seems very interested in crafting legislation here. The Biden administration actually put out an executive order um, a year ago or so saying, you know, we recognize the potential of this technology and we want to make sure the risks are mitigated. You know, they asked the branches of government to go introduce this. We're also seeing um, some of the presidential candidates already uh, for, for next year kind of start to talk about their stances on crypto and how they want to accept crypto as, you know, for donations and how it should be regulated. So I actually think there's a good chance this becomes, um, you know, a relevant issue in the 2024 elections. You know, with that said, this could be an overhaul, uh, overhang for a while here when we look at how long that this could play out, not just for you, but the whole industry. What does this mean for crypto prices overall? Do you think that it's spooking some investors away in your conversations with big institutions? Well, uh, you know, yesterday this news came out and um, surprisingly to me, you know, crypto was up that day. I, I you know, I think what's what I interpret from this is that um, the SEC's rhetoric on this has been clear for a year or two now. And they've been making lots of statements. And so I think if there is an overhang, it's probably already been there for a while. And I don't, I don't think anybody was surprised by this news that came out because the Wells notice came before it and the rhetoric was there before that. So 
our investors are uh, they're they're long term believers in this technology. I think they're looking at it as an opportunity. Frankly, you know, if others are fearful, it's it's probably an interesting buying opportunity for them. Um, but they're they're excited about this as one of the three or four major technology trends happening in the world. And I think they, you know, smart investors recognize that the U.S. is not going to sit on the sidelines. This is too important of a technology. Ryan, thank you so much for your time and for joining us on the back of such important news for the industry. Ed, back to you. Bloomberg Shinali Bassett with Brian Armstrong, CEO of Coinbase. Thank you so much. Caroline. Well, time's run out. That does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. What a whirlwind, Ed. Yeah, and don't forget, you can recap that whirlwind, the podcast, the pod. Check it out. Apple, Spotify, iHeart, wherever you get your podcasts. From SF, from New York, this is Bloomberg. Bloomberg.